I think every sax player in the world has seen that video where Leo P plays the intro to Monin at the BBC Proms. That intro was just Barry sax and drums. And today I'm gonna to break down some of the techniques Leo used in that performance to build up tension, draw in the audience, and rack up millions and millions of views for a viral video. Jay Metcalf here from bettersax.com, and if you like saxophone lesson videos like this one, be sure to drop me one of these right now, and make sure you are subscribed to the channel as we approach the 200,000 subscriber mark. I've got some great surprises that I can't wait to share with you, and I wouldn't want you to miss out on those. So the first thing we gotta do is choose our weaponry. I'm playing my Yanagisawa B901 Low A Barry Sax, and for mouthpieces, I wanted something with a high baffle that articulates well, like really fast. So I chose this Jody Jazz Super Jet you know, I don't play a lot of Barry Sacks. I need all the help I can get, and this one makes it easier for me to pull off some of the techniques Leo's playing. I find that playing a soft to read also helps, so I'm playing a two and a half. Now, I know Leo plays a Theo Wani Durga mouthpiece now, but back then he had something different, and I'm not sure what it was. You know what? Let me call him up, get him on the phone, and ask. Yo. Hey, what's up, man? It was an SR Tech mouthpiece. Um, I I'm, I'm going to keep looking for it. I know it's somewhere in here. I mean, I'm much happier now with the Theowani. I play the Theowani Dirt 3. And, Tip um, opening? Uh, I, wait, let, look I, at I it. I can grab that yeah, one. Yeah, take a look. <laughs> Give me one sec. I love that you don't know the tip opening though. Two hours later. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. Eight star. Honestly, I go between two and a half and three. Like, I'm I'm basically a a two and three quarters. Okay, pretty cool. So Leo's gonna help me explain what he played in that performance. Let's check out that solo intro and break down each section. I think we basically ran through it once. Um, I said, I'm going to do this vibe whenever I start building, you know, bum, 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 dun, 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 Mac build, build with me. And then we'll go into another little jam. And then, um, I said like, at some point I'm going to look at you and I'm like, whatever that part. Um, so I just set up those like, that was just like a template. They start out with eight bars of drums while Leo comes onto the stage, and then he does his signature low A overtone glissando to start things off. Yo, did you want me to show you some of those gliss, like the gliss that I do? Yes, I would love like, for you to show me that. The big one that I do is on the low A, like, basically like the, the lower the note, more powerful it is. This sounds really hard to do at first, but if you've been practicing your overtones, it shouldn't take too long to get something that sounds close. So with that, I can go all the way up and down. Like... And so it's kind of hard to explain what I'm doing, but I know I'm putting like extra pressure on the reed and kind of moving my bottom lip up and down the reed. Like Leo says, use increasing pressure from your bottom lip and also roll your bottom lip up and down to gliss across the overtones. One thing that I'll practice is, um, I'll be like. <laughs> like that kind of stuff is something I'll practice. Man, it's so hard for me to to explain because, I mean, most of my techniques came from uh, playing in the subway for like, whatever, five or six hours every day for like three years. Because it's like when people were like, oh, you must have practiced it so much. I was like, well, it's not exactly practice. Like I, I was performing every day in the subway. It's, it's kind of a little, it's like in between practice and performance. <laughs> Now that first 
first baseline groove that Leo plays is easy enough until you add the element of dancing to it. Yeah, like I, I was only dancing a little bit when I first started playing, busking. And then it was like, the more I danced, the more money I got. So I was just like, okay, like, let's go. I try to dance like Leo while playing that just to see how much higher the level of difficulty went up. And not only is it a lot harder and very physical, but it's also pretty dangerous. So I try to never land with the mouthpiece in my mouth if I'm like jumping high. Um, that was like the main rule that I made pretty early on. You know, I definitely went through some pain at first. I chipped my front teeth a little bit, but um, no nothing too bad. You just get like a little bit lightheaded. It's kind of a it's like in intense feeling. Like I just, I kind of like love it, especially with the low A's. So you're also gonna wanna be in good shape since this style of playing is, let's say, aerobically challenging. It feels like a different art form to me, almost. Like it's like a sport or something where it's like about endurance. I want to explain that I'm definitely not circular breathing, um, but I'm breathing really fast. I'll make a bass line where it's like boom, 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 or, or uh, boom, boom. Like sometimes like boom, 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 But like, you know what I mean? I always put little, little quick breaths in between my phrases so that it's like doable. In this section, Leo changes up the bass line and adds this fast percussive overtone gliss. These are a lot harder since they're played on the middle notes of the horn and go by really fast. It's the same thing when I do it fast, like, or, I spent a bit of time practicing that and eventually was able to get a decent result. It's definitely something that you're gonna have to work on for a while though to build up the endurance and the speed. <laughs> the next part is a Leo P signature where he just plays one altissimo note over and over articulated uh, with the left hand and uses his right hand to gesture to the audience. He explained to me the fingering he does for this is a low A fingering, but without the right hand. So he's basically putting all the fingers down in the left hand. The challenge with that though is the fast articulation. I always start with the breath attack. That's really important to me. Of course he makes that sound easy. The fact that he's starting his notes with a breath attack was a surprise to me though. But then after thinking about it, it makes sense. By putting the emphasis on the air rather than the tongue, you're gonna get more power out of the notes, which is gonna help you with the speed and the rhythm. The way I think of it is like, I'm using a breath attack. When I'm playing multiple notes, it's all one note and the tongue is just used to lightly differentiate between the notes. So I'm thinking like, da, and the tongue's like, da, I also asked which part of the tongue he's using when he's articulating. Um, I guess like, kind of the middle actually. <laughs> back to the basic baseline groove, but this time with more intense dancing. Check out those shoes though. I actually got these in Paris. I haven't even worn them since because I just like love them so much that I don't want to mess them up. Short, 
Do not underestimate the power of the chromatic scale and dynamics. Sometimes the simplest things can be super effective at building tension and excitement. The next section, he plays a simple bass line for 16 bars all on off beats, another simple device, but it builds up tension nicely. This next section, he goes back to the bass line with the overtone glis glissandos, but he ends the phrases with the 16th note blue scale licks. <laughs> And also he plays this other classic blues lick. Uh, I'm calling this the one-handed blues lick because he's playing everything with one hand. The first two notes are just the front F fingering, I believe, and the last note is Pumpkey D. And it's funny because both of these classic blues licks are part of my blues language course that you can find over at bettersax.com. He continues this for another eight bars, ending on a big low A overtone glissando with like this rhythmic wide vibrato in it. Now another chromatic scale buildup. Notice how he gets the audience really fired up with these. He continues building tension, this time with a repeated six note chromatic scale bass line, again played only on the off beats. This is the beginning of what we could call a cadenza, where he's playing a straight up D minor pentatonic scale pattern. I put a link in the description below to the Better Sax Shed. That's a page with all of my free download materials, PDFs, MP3s, stuff like that. In one of those lessons, you will find that exact pentatonic scale pattern. Now he ends it with a simple blue scale going up and sort of climaxes on that one-handed blues lick from earlier. And he bends and growls that note to get maximum effect. Of course, it has to end on another low A and the signature overtone gliss to bring it all full circle and get us into the beginning of the arrangement of Monin. I know for me, when I saw this video, it was the first time I fully realized how impressive Leo is as a saxophone player and a performer. Often appearances can be deceiving. We're so conditioned to the image of the conservatively dressed jazz musician that when you see the guy with pink hair and zebra shoes dancing wildly with a Barry sax in the subway, you might get the idea that he's not serious about the art form. But with Leo, nothing could be further from the truth. Obviously, I'm really happy that that, that came out and that I did that. Uh, one of the biggest reasons was it really got to me that for so many years, um, the people that did know me were from these like iPhone <laughs> 5 or 6, like recordings from a subway um, where it's like, 
I, I have a good tone, like I promise. So it was really cool to have something viral that like was like a good recording, you know? That stuff used to really get to me at first. Um, and then honestly, like one day, I had this like realization where like, I am what I am. Like, I don't care what people want to call it or what people think it is or this or that. Like Leo also told me that he was really nervous before that performance. But it wasn't for the same reasons most people would have been nervous. So I was like really nervous. I had a tour leading up into the gig. During that time, I was like, I have to get this outfit picked out for the BBC proms. As tour goes, stores kept closing after sound check, and this kept happening, that kept happening. So I got found the shoes and pairs. Then the suit was like I had like ordered to different stores, and I went to pick up. And then it was like, oh, actually, it's going to be here tomorrow. So I kept on missing the suit. And I got the suit the day of the show. And, like, literally right before sound check, I was, like, buying a shirt and buying the ascot. And, like, it was, uh, I don't know. It was just so nerve-wracking. I love that the most nerve-wracking part of that show for Leo was his wardrobe. The second it started, um, it, uh, I just, it was fine. I mean, it was better than fine, but it's cool. In these days of the pandemic, where touring is out of the question, you know, musicians like Leo, who would normally not be accessible, have time on their hands to do online teaching. Uh, Leo has been doing that lately and shared with me some of the things he's been talking to his students about. The saxophone is still a kind of a young instrument. Like, there's so much more stuff to figure out on it. No one knows everything. And when I teach, it's like, no matter how much stuff you learn from somebody and how much stuff you figure out, like, go spend time making your own sounds, creating your own um, vision of what you want to sound like. Even when kids ask me, like, how do you make that sound? I'm like, I could try to explain to you, but, like, I, I think you should try to make your own sound. Spend, spend 20 minutes every day, like, not playing notes, playing any type of crazy sound and, and, and trying new stuff because if you only practice what people teach you, you only learn what they know. If you only practice stuff that people teach you, you'll only know what they know. That right there is a very profound statement and reminder to us all to explore sounds outside the confines of our traditional teaching and learning methods. So when I first started playing stuff like that, I was trying to transcribe like electronic, like I was listening to a lot of Skrillex specifically. Um, and like, that's like when like dubstep was like really popular. And I was trying to transcribe what the synthesizers were like doing. Another thing I always tell students is like, well, if you only transcribe sax players, you're only gonna sound like sax players. A big thanks to Leo P for helping me make this video about him and for making the saxophone world a more interesting place. Thank you for watching and see you again soon in the next video. So I call it purgatory when I get to that middle part, like, I call it purgatory. So when I'm in purgatory, I can stay there, I can also change notes.